Uh, so yeah, thank you very much, Alex, for the introduction. Thank you for having me here. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I look forward to um, you know, having a really great interaction. I'm going to try to talk about a few projects today, some of my uh, academic work um, when, back when Alex and I first met, and then, but then showing how I'm translating that to the kind of applied work that I do at, at RAND. Um, so I'm going to start with what the idea of what cultural inheritance is, and that culture has real inheritance and transmission of information. So there's lots of things out there um, in the universe. There's things like this. This is our sun, right? It processes energy. It has a beginning and an end. There's variation in these things. There's variation in these stars. There's differential survival. Some of them, live, some of them exist longer than others, right? There's other things, like this is an asteroid, right? It doesn't process energy. But there's lots of variation in these things. They, uh, last different amounts of time. Um, there's planets, right? This is familiar, the star planet. But when you get down on some of these, not most of them, but when you get down on some of them, there's things like this, right? And you're like, whoa, these things look totally different from all those other things that are just these globby, right, um, objects around. They have really complex features, the grass, the pumpkins, my kids, our dog, the trees. Right? And how are they able to do this? Right? They have beginnings and ends. Everything has beginnings and ends. They process energy. Other things process energy. And what I contend is the reason this happens, right? the, the key thing, and I, I think we all know this um, from, from evolution, the, the key thing, the reason why this happens is because they have inheritance. Because they're part of these lineages where information gets transferred between individuals. Right? And it's the information that gets transferred. I'm not like replicating my matter into these kids. I'm, I'm taking macaroni and cheese and chicken nuggets and I'm transforming it into human children, right? Because I gave them some information, started them going, and now they're just continuous processors of mac and cheese. Um, so that's why, right? So popula that's why populations evolve. Individuals don't evolve at all, right? Individuals are just, they just have these features, right? But they've been built up through these lineages of information getting pushed around and, and kind of um, having these algorithmic effects happen to them. And so culture is like that, right? So if there's real social transmission of information, right, where individuals can acquire information states from others or I can transmit information uh, to someone else and replicate that information state through social learning, then you can have real um, evolution of culture in that sense of not just change over time, right? Like it would be change over time if we just changed economic incentives and then everybody rationally started doing something else, right? That would be change over time, but it wouldn't be cultural evolution in the sense of there's information moving about, and some of that information gets, uh, makes more, it gets into more copies or has more success at, at, at spreading um, and so forth. And so we, one of the publications we put out uh, last year in 2018 was this Manual for Cultural Analysis that takes this notion of culture um, as its starting point. And a lot of people have talked about this, this idea of culture. And I, I don't mean to say that everything that humans are doing all the time is strongly cultural, but it has important um, dynamics when it's happening. Now, when we talk about culture, one of the things we tend to do is we like immediately go to like our biggest things, right? Like look at, look at these huge cultural complex things we made, right? Like religions and governments, right? They're clearly socially transmitted. And so that's like the first thing we, that comes to mind. But culture goes way back, way back to before our species. And I think there's still a lot we can learn from breaking down cultural inheritance mechanics to this kind of level. So this is a, a capuchin, brown capuchin monkey. Um, I say a different species, but this is a brown capuchin monkey using a hammerstone to pound open a nut on this um, flat um, substrate. This is another stone. They repeatedly come to the same places to do this. And this uh, juvenile is, is learning by watching this. So we have pretty good evidence. There's been lots of experiments on this, that this is a socially learned behavior. We could just take naive, like captive capuchins and put them out there. And they would do kind of percussive behaviors or try to do extractive foraging because that's a natural thing for capuchins to do. That's somewhat instinctual. But actually to get the formed behavior of using these hammer stones the right way to get these nuts open, they have to have this social learning context, right? Because they can do this, they can actually live through these semi, um, uh, somewhat arid woodland forests uh, through a large swath of southern Brazil, where otherwise they pretty much wouldn't be able to live there because they wouldn't be able to get enough calories if they couldn't access these nuts. They can't bite them open. They're too hard. Right? So it's like a very simple kind of uh, culture. It transmits between individuals. And what's neat about capture monkeys and what, what I was working on early on is um, they're, they're actually not 
Um, they're not very smart in, in how they do this. They have very simple cognitive mechanisms for actually learning things. They mostly use this thing called stimulus or local enhancement, or sometimes it's called uh, social enhancement in the literature. So these are some sketches from Elisabetta Wieselberghi's experiments. What she did was she showed um, to these naive monkeys a trained monkey who would take uh, a nut, put it down on the ground, and then smash it open with a board. Okay? These are captive monkeys, so we know what their social exposures were. Put the nut down, smash it with the board, pick it up and eat it. Right? And then the observers who saw this were more likely to interact with the nut and the board, but they do things like what you see in these, in these sketches. Right? So this one put the board down and smashed the nut on it, but that doesn't generate enough force to open it. This one's pounding the nut on the floor, right? arguably both doing better than this guy in the middle, put the nut in his mouth and then is banging the board on the ground. Right? And it's not because he has like abstract magical thinking. Right? It's because they don't they're not imitating. They didn't really learn anything exactly about what to do or about some causal model for how the nut and the board are related. What they learned is, I need a nut, I need a board, and I need something to hit something really hard. Right? And from there, they kind of just figure it out through trial and error learning. But that gets them started down the right path. And this is pretty much how capuchin monkeys do it. It's pretty much how they do their culture. Right? There's other fancier things that humans can do. Humans actually still use a lot in experiments. Humans use a lot of stimulus enhancement too, right? Like you ever, I don't know, done anything like learn to work on a house or a car. Like there's a lot of just like, oh, I saw this, I saw my dad working on this part. Maybe I'll fuss around with it until I can figure out, oh, it turns this way. Oh, okay, right? There's like a lot of that, right? And so what I like to say is that they're Curious george in, right? Like so anyone who has kids probably watched Curious George. And what does Curious George do? Like he sees the man with the yellow hat do stuff. And then when the man in the yellow hat leaves, he just gets the same stuff and he does things, makes a huge mess, but by the end he figures out what to do with it, and then the man in the yellow hat comes home and says, George, right? So he came up with this model that you can get a lot out of social learning, just get started down one of these paths, right? Um, and, and if there's reinforcement learning, so any, any kind of basic learning model is that there's these trials, and as you go through learning trials, you get better until you get to some plateau of how to do things. Right? And then you don't get any better anymore. You just know how to do it. Now, there might be different alternative behaviors that are, some are better, some are worse. Right? Like, you might be like me, like, I come out of biology, so I got started with R, and now I'm a like, pretty good R programmer. Right? So I got started down here, and now I'm up here with R, and, I'm, and like, things happen. I get data sets where I'm like, man, I really, I, I, would, I would do this better if I, if I use Python. Right? I could like, be up here with Python. Right? But I just keep using R because I have to learn Python. I have to climb up this thing. Right? In any given project, I could just get it done or I could pay this kind of cost here to learn, to learn Python. Okay, so, um, so early on I had this idea that, um, that just reinforcement learning interacting with even very simple social learning would kind of create these emergent properties where you get uh, group typical traditions even because this is the thing in these capture monkeys we can see different groups have different styles of doing these nut pounding behaviors and so forth right so it's like how do they have these group typical traditions when they don't like they don't have any cultural conformity they don't have any concept that like we are the monkeys who pound the nut this way or something like that's like totally beyond their cognitive abilities so with Matthias Franz, we built an agent-based model where we just allowed reinforcement learning and social enhancement to interact. Right? And because of this effect, where you have, let's say, you have two behaviors, behavior Y has a higher payoff. Right? If you introduce social enhancement learning across many simulations, basically every time, behavior Y becomes fixed in the population as like the only thing that gets done. Right? And every individual is getting a benefit now because they don't have to pay this, this cost of learning it, trying out behavior X a whole bunch, right? To kind of learn through trial and error what to do, right? Because since behavior Y is better, just through individual reinforcement, it will be more common. And then because it's more common, that's more likely the thing you see and get started doing. So there's this feedback that happens between those. Okay. We, um, in equal payoffs, if we just have two behaviors, or just, let's say they're both, they're, they just both have the same payoff, like it just doesn't matter, but R and Python are just as good as the other, right? We get the emergence of these, what we call adaptively neutral traditions. We just get these, so different groups will fix on one or the other, right? Because of the same feedback. 
Um, now, there's an interesting um, condition where if we, if we model something that is a better payoff, but it's harder to learn. So what I mean by that is, let's say this, this behavior that's up here, right? The learning curve actually comes down like this and it crosses. And so down here in the early stages, it like looks worse, right? Like it's harder to learn, right? But eventually you'll get better, right? So in that case, just having social enhancement ends up consistently with a maladaptive uh, behavioral tradition, right? So you end up worse off than if you had just used reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning isn't good, particularly good at this condition, right? Like things that are harder to learn but have a higher payoff, like you need lots of repeated trials and, and so forth. Reinforcement learning isn't that good at it. And one of the things that can solve this problem, though, is what we, what we, called, we called imitation, but mathematically we just modeled it as, like it's really just some kind of higher level uh, cognition about social learning, where by watching you, it's not just that my attention is drawn to it, and so I'm more likely to start on one, but just by watching you, I vicariously get better, so I actually get further up a curve without having individual trials myself, right? Because I watched you, or you taught me, and I, was, I paid careful attention, right? So I was better than a naive individual. When caption monkeys do this, their attention is drawn to something because of a social experience, but they're not actually better at it than if they were just totally naive and they had never seen that other monkey do something. So that was, um, that was some of my uh, early work through my PhD and my postdoc. And there's, um, the, the, what I want to emphasize about this is that when you start to break down the mechanics of how information gets transferred, you get these um, emergences happen that really affect the evolution of the, the behaviors themselves, right? Now, in the literature, I mean, humans absolutely have more complicated kind of social cognitions and use things, but sometimes the literature is really focused on these to the exclusion of just the basic um, inheritance mechanics and what that does in a group. So there's things like, um, you know, besides, besides just using imitation or something, you could come up with strategies, social learning strategies, to try to pick better behaviors or more adaptive behaviors that have this high, higher plateau. So prestige bias is one that's been talked about. You could look at prestigious individuals, do what they do, um, and, and perhaps in the evolutionary past, right, when we were hunter-gatherers, that, that may have been more adaptive than, than maybe it is today. Um, another thing that's gotten a lot of attention is conformity bias. So conformity bias, the idea is that um, your probability of adopting a trait is a, not a linear uh, function of the frequency of it, right? So if, my, if, if I have a 60% chance of adopting something that is 60% common, that's not conformity bias, right? Even though I'm adopting the majority. Conformity bias is I have like an 80% chance of adopting a behavior that's 60% common, right? I, I'm biased towards what the majority of the group is doing. There's a lot of literature that implies that you have to have conformity bias to have group typical traditions. But that's not true. Group typical traditions very readily emerge from very simple social learning mechanisms. And that's not just in models. We see that in capuchin monkeys and other animals that have social learning, very simple social learning. They already have group typical traditions. Um, during my postdoc, uh, my advisor, Charlie Nunn, was working on some of these dynamics in a, in a more populational context with natural selection. And one of the things that he demonstrated in an agent-based model is that when one behavior is really quite a bit more adaptive, meaning there's a good strong selection pressure for it, basically you don't need these more complicated things, right? Like all this simple stuff just works in that case, right? Because the, the bad behaviors are getting selected out. Like those demonstrators aren't around for you to copy them because they died, right? Because they're doing bad stuff. Um, so, so these, these um, biases are really important when there's, there's just like a narrow margin, basically, right? And you're trying to select between behaviors of like a pretty narrow margin between which is better or worse. Um, I do think part of the reason a lot of the literature focuses on this is because um, most of us researchers who are working on it are weird. Right? We're Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, and people who are weird like to see big phenomena like social phenomenon instantiated within the minds of individual people or individual monkeys. Or something. And that was definitely what was going on like in the capture monkey uh, research there's a lot of work trying to find this more complex cognition that the capuchin monkeys must have because they have these group typical behaviors. Okay, so um, we can use this approach to thinking about um, applied policy outcomes too. So that's what I've been doing and that's how I got into the social network analysis company where basically we were 
doing uh, marketing and organizational management applications that were based on the spread of information across human social networks. So a lot of this is going to be much shorter um, time frame. It's just cultural transmission. Um, but these have important policy outcomes. So one that I'm working on right now, and I want to acknowledge that uh, Hank Green at Indiana University is the PI of this, the uh, National Institutes of Health Supported Research. Allison Ober is a great colleague of mine at RAND who's leading up the qualitative part of this work where we're doing interviews with physicians after the analytics to try to test whether our um, hypotheses out of the analytics are right. Um, what we're working on is a drug uh, called PrEP, or pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. So this is a drug, uh, a daily pill that someone would take who's at high risk for HIV, and it's been shown to be quite effective at preventing them from becoming uh, infected with HIV if they're exposed, as long as they're taking the pill every day. Okay? Um, well, within the U.S., it would only be indicated for men who have sex with men who also have some other kind of high-risk uh, factor, um, like they have a long-term partner who is positive and for whatever reason is not on antiretroviral therapy all the time, or they um, you know, have some casual sexual encounters and they're not using condoms, um, IV drug users as well. Mostly it's MSM with some kind of um, risk behaviors. So within national claims data, we have national claims data for this project from all payers, private payers and uh, public insurance, okay? There's, um, there's about th just over 300,000 primary care type physicians, okay? And, and almost all of them are prescribing, uh, have some patients where they're prescribing drugs for general herpes. So some, someone who has general herpes would not have an outbreak all the time, but they would always have the drug on hand in case an outbreak happens, right? So Nearly all primary care physicians have patients with general herpes, is the point. Not everyone with general herpes would be indicated for PrEP, but the point is, like, basically every primary care physician in the country is seeing patients who have enough sexual activity that, that they've contracted general herpes, right? Um, but only um, uh, a tenth of them, uh, primary care physicians, are prescribing PrEP. So it's, it's recognized within the healthcare community that it's an underprescribed drug, and it's partly because HIV care happens with infectious disease physicians. Those, that's the specialty that cares for HIV patients in the U.S. Anyone who has HIV is going to get their care at an infectious disease doc. And so historically, dealing, just dealing with this issue is not something that primary care physicians have dealt with. But really, this should be being prescribed in primary care, right, because these are individuals who don't have HIV. General herpes would not be a reason to go to infectious disease docs. Routinely treated in primary care. Okay. Um, so physicians influence each other. We know that. There's been a bunch of um, studies of this. Uh, that's word of mouth. So there's some good studies showing that at least 12% of the uptake of a drug is word of mouth um, can advertising between physicians rather than visits from drug reps. Um, so, I mean, and th these are their professional colleagues, so that's how they, that's how they hear about drugs um, that, they, that they might want to prescribe and when they would um, prescribe them. So what we've been trying to do is use this insight to develop some policy options for more efficiently disseminating information about PrEP, which reaching out to physicians, talking to them, getting information to them is a very large scale and expensive um, <laughs> undertaking. Even the big pharmaceutical companies would typically only send an in-person sales rep to 10% of the physicians in a market. Okay? They have a lot of money, but that's all, the, that's, that's all the spend they have for a given market. Right? So they carefully target who those sales reps would go to. So here are some basically just different hypotheses, like different strategies that we could use, or strategies we could use based on hypotheses that have been put out there. So people have noted that there are some gaps in insurance coverage for PrEP. So maybe people, patients aren't on PrEP because they don't, their insurance doesn't cover it. Um, if there's this um, network effect, then we could potentially um, message certain highly central individuals within a network. That would be an efficient targeting strategy, individuals who are more connected. Um, we could also message individuals that are um, uh, not prescribing, but they're already connected to a prescriber. Right? And this is done in um, consumer marketing all the time. Right? So, so if I find uh, that um, um, Al Alex is, uh, I don't know, gets a 
buys a certain lawnmower, right? I might be like, maybe Damien wants this lawnmower too, right? Because there's some kind of relationship there. I don't really know anything about Damien, but probably he has some traits that are more similar to Alex than just somebody to pull off the street, right? So it's like a better bet that he might also want the lawnmower. Um, we could maybe utilize relevant specialties like infectious disease docs. They know all about PrEP, right? And, and maybe that would be uh, a strategy for disseminating it. Um, there's also uh, potentially a concern though that infectious disease docs could be a sink, right? So if I'm like a primary care doc and I know some infectious disease docs, I might just like, if I find out maybe a patient's indicated for PrEP, I'll, I'll just send them over to, I'll just send them over there, right? So like I can just keep doing what I do. And that was the policy at some health systems for quite a while also to kind of manage the rollout of this. Okay. Uh, so just some basic ideas about network centrality I want to talk about since I know not everyone would, you know, have, have exposure to those concepts. There's different ways to measure. This is just a toy network, right? There's different ways to measure how connected someone is. And basically these dots represent individuals and these are relationships. And, and th there's many aspects of network analysis. What we're, what we're focusing on today is that these relationships are pipes that information can, can flow down, right? So there's some individuals who are central in the sense that they're part of like the most centered, highly connected clump within the network. All these human social networks, like real ones, not just toy ones, have this kind of clumpy look to them, these, these clusters. So that, that's what we have a measure for that called eigenvector centrality, because we like fancy words for our centrality measures. Um, another concept is betweenness centrality. Betweenness centrality, you see, is a totally different idea of centrality, right? So betweenness centrality, eigenvector mathematically captures the nodes that are most connected to the most connected nodes to the most connected nodes. Um, betweenness centrality uh, captures what individuals sit on the greatest number of shortest paths through the network between any nodes, right? So this individual sits on a lot of shortest paths because all the paths from these three to any of these other nodes in the network have to go through this individual. So high betweenness centrality individuals are important brokers of information in a network. They can often charge a rent on information that goes through them, but that's like another talk. Um, but, but that's what's important about them. They're often not the cool kids within any social clique, right? They're not actually at the center of any social clique, but they broker between these things. There's another measure called transitivity, and that has to do with how many of your friends are also friends with each other, right? So these individuals, all of their friends all know each other. And as um, Nicholas Christakis um, used to like to say, this is, a really good, oh, whoop, this is a really good position to be in if you want to go out and hunt a mammoth, right? Because you've got all these friends who are also friends. It's like a cohesive group, right? Like this is how we organize military units, right? It's not a good position to be in if you want to find a mammoth, though, right? Because I'd be like, Sergey, you know where a mammoth is? Like, no. You go to Alex, hey, you know where a mammoth is? No. I don't, we've been sitting in this room all day talking to each other, right? We only know each other. It'd be much better to be this guy if you want to find a mammoth. But he can't hunt one. Doesn't, you know, none of his friends are friends. Um, you could also, we could also think about this issue of prestige bias that's been talked about in the anthropological literature, right? That would be this kind of infectious disease docs potentially are prestigious with respect to this. And, and physicians do routinely do this. I mean, they'll go to like a cancer doc for, to get consults about cancer stuff or an ID doc to get consults about HIV. So they recognize that, that that's someone who knows more potentially about a topic than they do, right? So that would be leveraging prestige bias. Another important thing about networks is that they're highly... Um, uh, non-independent statistically. And that means that so far, I've just been talking about this like it's regular data, right? But when I said this transitivity measure for this guy is very interrelated with the transitivity measure for that guy, necessarily, right? Because it's determined by all the same friends. So in a sense, I've re-measured these same friends over again. So we have like a repeated measure issue. And the way I'll deal with that in this particular application, because I have gobs and gobs of data, so I can do it this way, is we'll just cross-validate and sample down to spread out subsets. So we're going to only include spread out subsets of nodes in, the, in each run of the analysis. Okay, so that now I have measures that are clean because this guy's network measures are not overlapping with that guy's network measures. So we ran some models. This is showing you a full model without the correction for non-independence. Um, there's 181,000 and change 
physicians in here. Some of these come straight from the, the network measures from these claims data. We have some volumetric measures in here, like the number of general herpes patients an individual has, the number of HIV patients, right? We'd expect those to be positively correlated with prescribing PrEP. Um, we also have, these are uh, pretty much all county level measures. We have this is a county level measure for um, how many of the plans in that county have, uh, have PrEP as a preferred medication. Uh, for coverage, right, meaning they, they cover PrEP. This is just the number of insurance plans as a control, whether you're urban or rural. Um, these cultural measures about um, uh, gay marriage and um, approved homosexual relations, those come from the general social survey. So does the county ever use intravenous drugs. Okay, but once we correct for the non-independence, um, this happens. Now, I don't think this is just a drop in power. I'm, I'm doing 10 runs, 10-fold cross-validation. We still have 18,000 data points per, per uh, cross-validation. But you can see some of these things, um, an apparent uh, relationship is really just this non-independence kind of thing, right? <clears throat> so particularly the insurance coverage issue isn't uh, significant. But interestingly, this cultural thing which is measured at the exact same level of messiness or precision, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, it's a county level measure for approval of gay marriage. That's still <laughs> highly significantly uh, associated with PrEP prescribing, right? So if there's, if there's disapproval of gay marriage in a county, then there's less PrEP prescribing. Um, we also find that these network um, features uh, can be important. So particularly transitivity, remember? That's like not the place to find out about the mammoth, right? So as expected, there's a negative coefficient there, right? So high transitivity docs are less likely to prescribe PrEP, which is a new drug. As expected, if you have more HIV patients and more general herpes patients, you're more likely to prescribe PrEP. Where this got more interesting at, uh, for us, though, is that we're able um, to fit a longitudinal model. So it's just a basic um, lagged regression model where we're predicting whether or not a doc prescribed PrEP in 2017 based on values from 2016. So we know whether they prescribe PrEP in 2016. We know whether their connections, their social connections prescribe PrEP in 2016. We know all their other uh, network features for 2016, right? And what you can see is that, yes, if they prescribe PrEP, of course, they're more likely to prescribe PrEP. It's still significant that they have, if they have more HIV and herpes patients, they're more likely. And despite controlling for all of that, if your social connections have prescribed PrEP, um, you're more likely to prescribe PrEP. So in fact, for every additional social connection a doc has in 2016 who prescribed PrEP, they're 5% more likely to prescribe it in 2017 themselves. The uh, gay marriage um, variable is still um, highly significant. And infectious disease docs, at least in this model formulation, we're testing some this bounced around a little bit in different model formulations. All the rest of this is highly robust, but at least in this kind of full model, the infectious disease docs appear to be this kind of sink that some people had proposed to us. So you're less likely to prescribe PrEP, we think probably because the primary care doc sends, sends his indicated patients over there. So he doesn't, he doesn't end up prescribing, the, or she doesn't end up prescribing the PrEP, right? I sent the patient over to the ID doc. So, um, there's some things we can, I think we can, based on this, particularly the lag regression, I think there's some things that we can pull out of this and say these are probably better policy levers to try to pull versus not so good policy levers to try to pull, right? So we said, well, we could try to message advantageous network positions and potentially the high betweenness individuals would be someone to do, right? In some of the regressions, they come out as less likely to prescribe PrEP, meaning they're not getting the word anyway Right? I mean, if they were just doing it anyway, we wouldn't, need to, we wouldn't need to target them. We've got a limited number of docs we can do direct outreach to. So if we target these high betweenness individuals, you know, we might be able to get them to start prescribing and then move it out to other parts of the network. Messaging non-prescribers who are connected to prescribers is just this classic marketing strategy, and we've shown that that effect is already happening, so you can try to accelerate it by marketing to people who are connected to, to prescribers of PrEP but haven't started themselves. And then this issue of the, the MSM stigma, at least with that as measured by that gay marriage 
disapproval question. Um, I mean, that was very consistent in our models. Now, addressing the, the views about homosexuality um, in some of these communities, that would be like outside the scope of the health policy community, first of all, and a really big lift. But I think that some of this, I think, is actually driven by things that could be changed in how doctors and patients interact. So that's where Allison is leading this team doing phone interviews with physicians. Because what we suspect is going on is that in counties, in, in subpopulations in the US where there's more disapproval of gay marriage, what, what, that, what, what really is, effect, that's not a direct effect. What really is going on, likely, at least likely part of it, is that those are also places where physicians and patients are having less conversation um, and less regular conversation about what a patient's sexual habits are. So there's primary care docs who may ask the question like at their first patient visit, when they first take on that patient as a new patient. Like there's some primary care docs who would ask it that one time. You know, so who do you have sex with? And might never ask it again. Might not even ask it then. So if the doc, if the primary care doc doesn't ask that question, it's relying entirely on the patient to volunteer. Hey, I'm a man who has sex with men and these are my sexual practices, right? It's relying entirely on them to volunteer that which they might be more reluctant to do in these types of contexts, right? It doesn't mean direct, I mean, physicians, yes, many of them come from their community, but they're also highly educated, um, very clinical people that I think typically would put aside their own um, value judgments in many cases, but there's also this patient side. I mean, if they're not asking the questions and, and you're in this kind of community, patients might not ask. So what, what we think could be done, and we're trying to do, like say, interviews that's more qualitative data to try to confirm this, what we think could be done is just shift that, that um, practice uh, behavior of when, when and how regularly do you, ask, do you ask these questions about sexual behaviors. Because like waiting until the patient is like, doc, it, you know, it, it burns when I pee, right? Like that's like, should have been asked sooner than the symptom. Um, okay, so what I want to say about this? Oh, so, um, so even if some of this is adaptive, like I started this with this very evolutionary kind of talk, right, about capture monkeys that have been doing this thing for like 10 million years, um, cracking open their nuts. Um, some of this might be adaptive, but clearly none of it's like an evolutionary adaptation, right? This is all like really novel technology. There's like novel things. But I just want to point out that like policy research needs to provide very specific recommendations to be useful. And I think there's a lot that can be done with just these short-term kind of inheritance dynamics, and that's what we're trying to manipulate, basically. Just these short-term kind of cultural inheritance um, features of how information gets transferred on networks. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about another um, applied project that is similar. We're trying to get to pretty specific recommendations, totally different topic, and if you're thinking about like doing applied policy research, this is like, often the way it is, like it's a project by project thing, there's like common themes. So sometimes actually, even at RAND, people are like, Luke works on a lot of different things, but here's the secret, I actually only work on one thing, right? Which is like transference of information um, among groups of people, right? Um, so from PrEP though, we'll go to childhood vaccination, which is another um, NIH funded project we've been able to do. Have a great team working at RAND, and also Jamie Tarani and Joe Stubersfield at uh, Durham University have been collaborators on this work. Um, so with um, childhood vaccination, it is recognized that we have um, an issue with um, um, vaccine hesitancy among parents, right? Some of this is tied to um, anti-vaccine conspiracy theories or kind of people are more zealous about it, right? And some of it is many of the parents are maybe not that extreme or committed, but there, there hasn't been a lot of research. There's been some, but there hasn't been a, certainly not an overabundance of research about what are the social dynamics behind um, anti-vaccine um, movements. Um, and so that, that was basically the, the start of this um, project. In a way, it's more exploratory and at a more basic level than the PrEP one I just talked about, where we have gobs of like this very precise data, we can map how all these physicians are connected to each other across the country. Like here, the question is much more basic, which is just, we know from pri the prior research that's been done that understanding of vaccine science is, is not like a really strong predictor of parents' decisions about vaccines, right? So you find that like parents who do vaccinate their kids, like when you run surveys with them, you'd be like, so how do vaccines work? And they'll be like, 
well, vaccines, you know, they kill viruses in your body, right? But that's not, right, that's not true at all. That's how antibiotics work. So what I mean is, like, we kind of know that just understanding the science isn't really what's driving this. Um, so the, 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 um, what we want to do is just figure out, well, what are people actually, how are people actually thinking about this topic, basically? And so what, what messages could we have that would engage with how people are thinking about it? Again, industry marketers do this all the time. Right, this is one of my um, favorite examples of this. So these are some Old Spice deodorant ads that ran a few years back. They, they ran concurrently, right? So on the left, you have Bruce Campbell sitting in this um, nautical themed uh, living room, right? And he talks about how if you have it, you don't need it. If you need it, you don't have it, right? And, and he just goes on like that. He never once mentions what Old Spice smells like, right? Because this ad was marketed to guys. And guys don't actually care what they smell like. Now, this ad, was the, it, this was explicitly run because Old Spice realized that sometimes the, the man's uh, uh, woman, um, you know, wife or girlfriend is who buys the deodorant for him, right? So what do you do? This is Isaiah Mustafa and grabs the um, female viewer's attention in a totally different way, right? And then there's, these are diamonds raining down from the Old Spice um, ad. And he was billed as, well, he said that the, the, the tagline is smell like a man, man. And he, he's, he's actually called in the ad the man your man could smell like. And he says, no, your man won't look like me, but he could smell like me. Right? So the, the point is these are totally different messages because they're trying to reach different audiences who think about this exact same product in different ways. It happens in healthcare marketing too. These are pretty functionally equivalent products. You could have many different lifestyles and use either of these products for erectile dysfunction um, pretty, pretty equivalently. Um, but in Cialis ads, there's always a couple um, so here, the, you know, there's the woman is reading a magazine, but she's twirling her hair, which, I mean, as every husband knows, is the universal signal for, actually, I want to have sex in the middle of the afternoon. Um, try it on your wife at home and see how it goes. But anyway, so Cialis, the tagline was, uh, because you never know when the moment is right, Viagra ads never show a couple. A little bit weird, right? But they never show a couple. There's, there's a single woman talking to the screen, or sometimes there's a bunch of guys doing bro stuff together like these guys, right? And the tagline is Viagra, this is the age of knowing what you're made of. Okay, so again, like pretty equivalent products but are marketed in totally different ways for different segments, right? So that was the gist of this, like how, how are parents thinking about this? How are anti-vax people thinking about this? Like what, what can we talk about? Um, yeah, so we asked people about a lot of beliefs after doing, we did a bunch of literature review and a bunch of qualitative work to come up with a list of beliefs that seemed to swirl around um, anti-vaccine uh, discussions. Um, and some of these go pretty far afield, but the point was this is what, this is what people were talking about. So we surveyed, in fact, all, for the past, since the Wakefield Affair, which is 2009, we read every article that asked people open-ended questions about what do you think about vaccines and so forth. That's how we came up with a bunch of these beliefs, right? So it's not like we, the researchers, we think this is what you should talk about, like how immune systems work, like this is what people are talking about. Um, so we have a range of things. We have longstanding conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories on the left and the right, um, some questions about vaccine uh, biology, uh, vaccine side effects. Um, most of these are just like putative side effects. Um, health conspiracy beliefs. And we try to be very open-minded about this. One of the differences between this survey that we ran and prior work that's been done on anti-vaccine beliefs or, or health conspiracy beliefs is we include some items that, that are true or at least supported, supported by evidence. Um, I like to, to reference the, um, the old Exorcist movies. One of the, one of the things that the, the senior priest says in the original Exorcist is beware the, the devil mixes the truth with his lies, right? So that's how he can, so that's what we did in this survey. We mix the truth with lies to, to try to get a more honest response. So some of the things are true, like vaccines can cause Guillain-Barre syndrome. That's actually true. I mean, that is a rare side effect that is pretty serious that can happen um, from uh, vaccination, right? But MMR does not cause autism. So that's like an example, right? Um, there's no evidence that chemtrails behind planes are being used by governments to poison people, but the CIA did run a fake vaccination campaign to try to find Osama bin Laden. That is, in fact, true. Right. 
once in a while, you know, they are watching you. Um, okay, so then, so we, 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 and what you're seeing here, um, we had some, we had independent raters who weren't a part of this study, um, well, rate these different features, like whether they thought something was conspiratorial or not, or pro-establishment or not. These are the loadings from just putting all these agree-disagree items into a principal component analysis, which is a statistical technique that tries to extract out the shared variation among a set of items. In this case, these are like zero to six, I agree, disagree with this belief scale. And we get people agreeing with all these. We get like at least 9% of people usually agreeing with, with any one of these things. I think the lowest one is like 5% of people agreeing. And they had an unsure option. It's like people, people this is a nationally representative US sample of parents with kids under 21. Good, thank you. Um, uh, no, these are just, I'm just interleaving the table to try to fit it on the slide. This is just one big table. It's all one principal component, okay? It's all on PC1, yeah. And what you can see is that, that there's, there's a general match between this pro-establishment, anti-establishment coding, right? And, and how things loaded, right? So basically everything loads positively except for these negative things which are like the pro-establishment views. Benefits of vaccines outweigh the risk. Vaccines cause your body to build immunity against disease, right? Now some of those are like supported, supported by evidence as well, right? Absolutely, but what, what's interesting is that the ones that are supported by evidence um, but they're kind of like anti-establishment ideas, they, they load the other way. Yeah. Yeah, we asked each one of these people had to rate them. I'm going to I'm going to get to that. Yeah. Yeah. So we didn't put that into the PCA. This is all the way into the PCA. And then we used the output of this PCA, you can actually then come up with a score for each individual, which is basically how anti-establishment or pro-establishment they are. And then we put that into a regression model with different predictors that are hypothesized in the literature to drive this, uh, these cultural notions that surround vaccines. Okay, so the outcome here is, are these anti-establishment beliefs as reflected by these principal component scores. And these are not nested models of e uh, within each other. So we used a uh, model selection technique uh, called the Bayesian information criterion. So lower numbers of BIC reflect a better fitting model. Okay. So one, one hypothesis is that, you know, that this is like a social exposure thing, right? And so we included separate questions that asked about who are your social ties? Do, do, um, do any of them, you know, have a, have a kid with autism? Uh, do, do, do you know, do any of them like not vaccinate their kids for flu or delay vaccines for their kids, right? So we tried to capture as best we could some of these social exposure um, ideas. Uh, we, had, we had a hypothesis that maybe this just like latent trust or distrust of institutions specifically. And the political scientists at RAND um, thankfully just had something ready to go for that. So it's one of the fun things of working at RAND is you, you can it's highly interdisciplinary, right? Um, one of the psychologists gave me this scientific reasoning scale that had been validated um, against kind of some external measures of scientific ability. So it's basically some puzzle questions we have people do. So we put all these things in, and one of the, the this wasn't necessarily my favorite hypothesis, but one of the hypotheses is that, you know, people like have a certain situation in our society, a certain socioeconomic status, and these beliefs about the pro or anti-establishment or like a kind of rationalization or, or a, a cognitive reckoning with that, right? So like, if I don't feel like, you know, society treats me all that well, I might have more anti-establishment ideas, right? Because that's how, that's how I understand this society. And that comes out as a really good model. You can make it better by adding the scientific reasoning scale to it. Scientific reasoning by itself is not a great model. So if we look at the actual variables in this model and what the coefficients are, um, it, it, it is pretty consistent with this um, interpretation as like a, a, a reckoning with or understanding of socioeconomic status. So um, minorities um, are, have more, you know, as a positive coefficient, so they have more anti-establishment beliefs compared to the reference category, which is white. That's true even for Asians. The p-value isn't astounding there, but it's still a positive coefficient, right? 
So Asians have more anti-establishment beliefs. Um, if you're more highly educated or if you're higher income, you have more pro-establishment beliefs, right? So it's more negative. So this is consistent with this kind of um, uh, you know, model from evolutionary psychology, right? If you're, if you're like, like me, right? Like you're well-educated and pretty high income and, and white and you work at Rand and you look around inside, you're like, I, I think society's working pretty well, right? I mean, um, okay, so then we also wanted to look at how does this predict parents' self-reported um, vaccination, like what they did with their kids. Now, admittedly, this is this parents who have kids under 21, we didn't specify the number of kids, but we, we asked them these questions about, have you ever delayed or declined vaccines for your kids, or you use a doctor who you know has a, a, an unusual vaccine schedule, right? Um, and that was our criteria for vaccine hesitance. Um, and I'll skip that. And we put that into a logistic regression. So here now, it's this self-reported vaccine hesitance is the outcome. And we just redid the same process, except now we included this belief score as one of the models that could could predict this outcome. Right? And we get this result using the same kind of comparison of a priori models that, wow, beliefs are like the only, that's the only thing that actually beats a null, hands down, is knowing what your belief score is, predicts whether or not parents report vaccinating their kids. Now, I mean, there could be a reverse causation here thing. Maybe you didn't vaccinate your kids, and then that induced you to rationalize all of this in terms of like whether or not the CIA ran a fake vaccination campaign or whatnot. So I think the breadth of beliefs argue against um, reverse causation, but it is possible, right? But I mean, my, my thinking is that, you know, like this might, th admittedly, this is my, like my stupid anthropologist view of the world. You go around and you get ideas and some of those ideas are like, hey, how do I generally explain my status in society? But then they have this effect because you have these ideas and that affects your behavior, right? So then it has a spillover effect on vaccination. If we just chunk it into a stepwise regression, so this is just letting the math pick what are the best variables in here. We get beliefs comes out we get being a uh, female rather than a male in the panel, but I, I basically think that's a kind of response bias is, is why that effect is there. Um, we get whether or not you voted, which I think again is a kind of response bias, and one social variable, which is reporting you have a social connection who also delays or declines vaccines, is predictive of you saying you delayed or declined vaccines. So what's interesting is that none of the demographic stuff directly comes out as predictive of the behavior. And we kind of actually knew that. We didn't know that about, about this. We knew that about this, in, uh, this output. People are often surprised by that because we all have limited social circles, right? But prior nationally representative surveys have shown that anti-vaccine uh, beliefs or behavior, that, that vaccine hesitance, it occurs in whites, blacks, low income, high income, low education, high education. So it was, it was known that it's actually not that well predicted by demographic features. Most people are surprised by that because like I say, we all have limited social networks, right? And so like, gee, everyone I know who's anti-vaccine is like this. And it's like, well, but that, that's kind of like everyone you know also, right? Um, we had age, I don't remember right now what if, yeah, it's in here. In, I mean, in our model, it's not significant. But again, this is all, parents who currently have kids under 21 is how we define the sample. So I mean, I think there has been, you would find a broad age effect, I think, if you kind of looked at it generationally, you see what I mean? But to kind of be more centered on, I don't know, we thought who was more like a, a decision maker, we, we focused on the kind of parents who had kids under 21. Okay, so, I know I'm coming to time, so I think I'm just gonna, I'll finish with this um, example of this, this um, project. But we had some, some of the policy recommendations that we're trying to think about for this are like very different messages to design um, for vaccine uh, behaviors. And again, this isn't really, this, this isn't all where I necessarily started with this project. We had multiple hypotheses, but this, these are the ones that bear out, right? So one of the things we're thinking about, we're gonna to try to do some experiments to test these messages, is rather than the typical message, try to have uh, kind of messages that play on anti-establishment tropes. So validate that you can still be anti-establishment, right? You don't have to trust the establishment, but you can still vaccinate your kids, 
right? So right, this, is, this is an ad that, that we made, but this is like a very similar poster to what you would see on the CDC website, like right now or in your doctor's office. Sometimes there's a family setting like this. Sometimes there's a, a physician, okay? But this is like typical thing. And so what we're, what we're starting to do is actually run some, some experiments. We like to run cognitive experiments, online experiments, and even uh, behavioral experiments testing out radically different vaccine messages that are still true, but they're saying something different about vaccines, right? So here we've got a Black Lives Matter protest and a Trump rally. We don't all agree about who you can trust, but we can agree vaccines are safe and effective. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. It's the important stuff. Thank you. So, <laughs> so this is great. Um, uh, so much of the sort of modeling analysis here uh, that you talked about was static of what, what we know about various impacts of various factors on attitudes. Um, so one of the things that we have tried to do here as well in working groups is to look at uh, dynamic models as to what actually effectively can change belief. And in order to do that, you actually have to incorporate something other than static stuff. And you're trying to get at that by the ad, ad pieces here. So yeah. my question is, what motivated you to think that these particular approaches, without doing any kind of dynamic model, might actually have impact in actually changing attitudes? Right. So, I mean, I think there's, there's um, layers to the modeling, and, and we're in the prep project where we are now, now that we've gone through the cross-sectional model and the, the time-lagged regression model, right, which we think answered some questions, we're now running a, uh, a dynamic model like you're talking about. We're using this package called NetDiffuse R, which was developed by Tom Valente. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things you can look at in a dynamic model like, like Tom's NetDiffuse R is we can look at the, this effect of conformity bias, right? So remember at the beginning I talked about conformity bias, that conformity bias potentially could amp up similarity within these clusters in the network, right? right? Now that, it's very hard to isolate an effect of conformity bias in a regression model, even a time series regression model. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think we are thinking about it in kind of like a stepwise approach. So I think with having fitted the time lag regression model, we're actually using the estimate from that. So we go back to that. So we're using the estimate from this as our basic uh, network contagion or network influence parameter mm -hmm. in the dynamic model, right? And then we can basically, in the dynamic model, we can turn conformity on or off and see if we end up with patterns that are uh, more or less consistent with what we observe empirically. Mm -hmm. but, but are there any survey datas that, that are themselves dynamic that you can look at the rate at which various network realignments occur, for example? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have longitudinal data, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. So with the, with the ALP, I mean, we have various certain data elements that are longitudinal. We don't have longitudinal network data. Mm -hmm. um, Nicholas Christakis, one of his, he and James Fowler, one of their yeah. famous studies was using the Framingham Heart sit, um, data set. Mm -hmm. Now there they had longitudinal data so they could look at the formation and dissolution of network ties. The challenge with that data says the ties are very sparse. There are only very limited network questions that are actually asked in that, in that data set. Um, so it's just, it's just a matter of the, the data access, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think with the, the computational aspect of dynamic models, I think where they're most powerful is where you like, isolate a specific feature of the dynamicness, right, mm -hmm. that, you can then, that you can then test with that, with that model. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Doug, for your very thoughtful presentation. Actually, I have two questions. One is more theoretical one. The second is, I would say, practical or political. <coughs> um, theoretical one mm -hmm. is you know, uh, the baseline of your considerations is that cultural inheritance 
leads. You know, it's following from your title of your presentation. Social, uh, cultural in inheritance leads to cultural evolution. That's right. the baseline of all you are following up. So my question is that you know, I'm thinking historically. Uh, each of us remember there were opposite way when cultural inheritance led to cultural devolution, not evolution. For example, Nazi Germany. Let me remind you, 100 years ago, after First World War, late 20s, early 30s, Germany as a country moved from the great culture in terms of yeah. philosophy, fine arts, architecture, everything, was one of the most advanced countries in Europe, to Nazi regime. Uh, so you focused, one of your major focus was on uh, learning mechanism that leads to cultural evolution. I'm thinking learning mechanism of that time, especially the first stage, the fir first stage of this, I mean, the late 20s, early uh, 30s, uh, the classical um, learning mechanism of that time in Germany was not controlled by Nazi. I mean, education system, religious institution, mass media of the time was out of the yeah, control. Yeah. They used some abnormal new mechanisms like, I don't know, mass street propaganda, street actions, and so on, yeah. until they got power. So it, it, it means that the mechanism as such could not explain why uh, cultural inheritance could lead to evolution or devolution. So this one example, historical. The other example from our time, I think each of us remember when internet appeared on the scene 20, 25 years ago, it was very common to expect that this new technology, this new mechanism of learning, inevitably led the system, the culture in Western world and not Western world to evolution, of course, you know, to improve the system, cultural system, social system, and so on. And to some extent it happened. But then we found out that it could lead to, you know what, uh, yes. dissemination of disinformation, fake news, you are involved yeah, as well as far yeah. as I know, and yeah. many, many others now. And that's why many countries, not only authoritarian, but democratic as well, are thinking now to introduce, to work out, introduce some limits. I'm not speaking about the firewall in China, in China, but even here, there are a lot of voices in the hill about some limitation for Facebook and so on. So, so again, it means that there's something new, very, very prominent mechanism of social learning led not directly to, to uh, cultural evolution. To some extent, yes, to some extent, the evolution. So my question is this one. Under what circumstances uh, cultural inheritance really lead to cultural evolution and under what circumstances to devolution? Right. Yes, yeah, so I think um, that's uh, I have a, one. a good question, right? And so I mean, I think you're, you're thinking about evolution in the sense of like, like where I started with, like building adaptations, right? And we sort of see like adaptations that are functional is generally good, right? But, um, but some of them like, in a normative sense, aren't, aren't good at all, right? Um, they might still, in, in kind of selfish ways, benefit the people who are engaging in them, right? Um, Alex Jones, who's one of my favorite um, uh, disinformation figures, right, um, has, has um, essentially no credentials to talk about anything, right? But he's been, um, until he was banned, fantastically successful. So it certainly was adaptive for Alex Jones to, to do all of this. It wasn't really good for society. Um, Alex Jones, for those who, for those who aren't um, disenlightened, um, <laughs> Alex Jones promotes has promoted conspiracy theories like you know 9/11 was an inside job, mass shootings are are hoaxes by crisis actors, um, and all sorts of you know, totally outlandish um, ideas. What's that? Pizza Pe Pizzagate, Pizzagate. He dabbled in Pizzagate. Um, so, but I think I think this you know what you're calling disevolution. Um, which in a normative sense, I, I totally agree with. I think still the kind of inheritance mechanics are important to that, and that's something that I think we're still trying to grapple with and figure out. I mean, we have different hypotheses going. We were talking about this just before the talk. One of the things that I think is an important feature is the shift that's happened in journalistic standards. Right? So major journalism publications now routinely report 
um, uh, events that they can't independently verify, right? And they'll put a disclaimer, the New York Times can't dis independently verify this event, which is like telling the jury, disregard the testimony you just heard. Just wipe that from your mind, right? So there was a time when papers wouldn't do that, right? Now I understand there's certain incentive structures that they're on with, that they're, um, that they're on the receiving end of, right? About a 24 seven news cycle and cable news and all this tabloid stuff and all this free journalism taking their market share. Like, I understand what, what's in it for them to change those standards, but changing those standards affects how information is spreading through the system in a negative way, in my view. Can I ask a second question, <laughs> practical one? Yeah, uh, about rent. I don't know to what extent uh, the topic that you uh, describe is, was included. Just a week ago, today is October 15, just a week ago, October 8th, the Russian Duma, Russian parliament, the upper chamber, which is the Senate, has an official hearing about uh, how the West striked Russian sovereignty uh, in case of uh, recent local elections. You know that in end of August, beginning of September, there was an election in Moscow, St. Petersburg, right. everywhere, and there was a huge protest and the Kremlin was very disappointed by the result because some opposing candidates were elected after dozens of thousands of people came to the streets of the big city, especially in Moscow. Right. So a week ago, uh, Senate made this official hearing and they blame the West is in the interference to <laughs> not uh, uh, Russian to American, but American to Russian election. And the basic point was that rent was behind of that and the rent walked out and introduced so-called mosaic technologies. It means that uh, something, uh, every piece was not obvious for the Russian public that, you know, rent was behind of that. We were, the we were behind the Russian. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. As, yeah. as is this uh, uncomfortable for the Kremlin results, yeah, yeah, behind it. yeah. But the general picture, of course, you know, I'm just quoting people from this hearing, prove that it was Western strike, and rent was my question. And you know, many mechanisms that you were saying about, for example, you know, uh, cultural learning, yeah. uh, seems very close to this uh, idea of uh, mosaic uh, technologies based on what the guys were saying. Right. So my question: Do you know about that? And uh, uh, any any? There's only one answer I can give either yes. way, isn't there? Um, no, uh, so my colleagues are, at Rand and I like to talk about these things, right? Because we usually say, you know, we wish we were that powerful, right? Um, that would be fantastic. So to, to be clear, what Rand does actually is, I mean, we are, we are supposed to be uh, uh, independent, nonpartisan uh, policy researchers, right? And I think we really pride ourselves on that, that we try to be completely objective and nonpartisan. Um, Part of what comes with that, and I know, uh, I mean, some of my colleagues and I sometimes really are frustrated by this. In a sense, we don't actually do anything at RAND, right? We research things, and then we advise other people who actually do things, hey, maybe you should do this, right? And like 90% of the time, or I don't know, okay, I don't know how much percent, but a lot of the time they're like, nah, that's a bad idea. I'm just doing this thing that I was going to do anyway. Um, yeah, I just, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not going to speak, I don't think our government engages in the kind of uh, disinformation propaganda that, that, um, that, that the Russian government does, right, frankly, um, but if it were happening, it, it wouldn't be RAND, it, it would, you know, it'd be an appendage of the government, but we really don't work that way. I was, I was thinking about the, the nice contrast between your two studies. One seems, like this one, seems to be based on conformity. And maybe that's why clustering is, it's hard to get a low frequency idea going in a clustered network that doesn't, you know, because you need, you need to get above a certain threshold. Yeah. It's like that old Duncan Watts model. Right, right. And your second one, th this leads to my question, what if what really binds all those ideas, those wacky beliefs together in your second is just that they're low frequency. And that maybe it's not gonna work by trying to say, by, with the messaging, maybe it does, I'm just being irritating. But maybe, maybe they just like them because they're low frequency and m maybe another way to get out there is to, is to give this some kind of illusion about frequency rather than work on the content. And is that maybe what binds them all together? Are they really actually 
connected as ideas, or are they just are they just people who collect low frequency lack because they're anti-conformists? They're they're yeah, part of that. You could try that. I, I like the idea of maybe trying to do something about their ex try a manipulation that involves their expectations about frequency. Um, I don't think it's just that. I mean, one, so one, some of these aren't that low frequency. Like, so 20% of the population believes in either 9-11 truth or Obama birtherism. Right? So some of these aren't that low. Um, most people, I forget what the mode is, but most people endorse several of those ideas on the list, right? Like a number of them. What if, um, what if you ask people what they perceive as the, the popularity of this idea? Do you think it would be lower or higher or right, right where it is? Do they feel like it's a friend's idea when it's actually... Yeah, we should, um, we should ask that. I mean, I think, um, I think in many cases people know it's a fringe idea. So, so maybe you're right. I mean, people are, if they're motivated to be nonconformist or something, then I think that could be part of it. Um, we are testing, like we have some very preliminary, I know you're flagging me, no, but no we have some very preliminary data. So part of this, there was a, there was a well-known study by the uh, um, great researcher Brendan Nyan, who's a political scientist who's mostly worked on different types of uh, political um, disinformation and propaganda, but he's done some very good work on vaccines as well. He did a study showing that um, when you present like little snippets of scientific evidence, like a lay person's three sentence explanation of vaccine science, on most parents it has absolutely no effect on whether or not they vaccinate. But for the anti-vax parents, it actually makes them less inclined to vaccinate, right? Like you get this kind of backfire effect where they dig in their heels, right? So I'm not sure if that goes along with the, the low frequency thing. I don't, I don't know. Um, we're trying to look at that with these posters as well. And so we need larger samples, so we haven't been able to get enough sample to really say anything conclusive, but we, we kind of have some trends going that this poster, in fact, is more engaging, but that it might actually still have the, the backfire effect, right? So it has started to change my thinking about it, which is that I'll think about the frequency thing, though. But I think what we could be dealing with is more like a very strong pre-commitment. Yes, Eric? Um, I really enjoyed how you looked at uh, creating independence for the physicians in, in your prep study. Um, but I didn't see whether you had done that with the insurance policies um, and whether that was an issue. And what's leading to that is that PrEP was just recategorized such that insurance companies are going to have to carry it. Yeah. And so that's going to be a radical change in the resistance to being able to uh, prescribe it. Do you have uh, any projections of how this change or signaling by the insurance companies are going to affect uh, behavior in your network, or are you planning to repeat this post, this major change, to see how it, that, it that's changes? A, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, um, I should make a, make a note of that. Um, it, it could have an effect. I mean, PrEP hasn't had the level of advertising outreach that a lot of other drugs would have, um, and there's a um, there's a set of uh, basically business considerations for, for why, why that happened. Um, but that's what you're saying, right? That by having this shift in the, in the insurance plans, it would basically be a kind of advertising about it. Well, it drug, seems right? like there's two parts. One, it's easier for them pres to prescribe if yeah. all plans cover it. But also, there's this huge signaling that's going on when um, it said that all plans must cover yeah, yeah, it, which yeah. shows that yeah, it's that's true. effective. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you could look at plans that covered now and yeah. seeing if it's penetrating equally and how much of it is the signaling versus the coverage or yeah, yeah. possibly. Yeah, that's true, yeah. I mean, I, th I think we may not, we don't have, you know, in our models, we don't have a strong signal for the PrEP coverage variable affecting the, the PrEP prescribing. And I think it, it's partly because, um, like, we have some maps I didn't put in here. Like, the low, the low coverage is the really low coverage for insurance is confined to certain areas at this point. Like, I think a lot of the hard work has been done to increase access, but it was an issue. Just as a follow-up to that, for the prescribing, is that actually successful prescriptions that have been filled or just that have been written? Only because the cost of PrEP without insurance is so expensive that that may limit people from actually filling those prescriptions. 
Right, those are the, the, all the claims are final paid claims or, or filled. So if, the, if it was a written prescription that was never filled, it would not show up in our claims.